So it's a brand new day here in Chicago, Illinois, and yeah, let's see what today has to bring for us. Okay, my computer says it's 9.40. This is on Eastern time, but 8.40, this is Chicago time. My phone went back one hour, while well, my computer didn't. Oh, okay, Vid Kids, we all want um, to Chicago so anyway, boat. Uh, I've been living in Chicago for about five or six years. I've always been a teacher of some sort. Uh, so uh, I've been usually taught languages, and now I'm teaching people about architecture as a tour guide slash docent. So anyway, uh, let's see. I uh, talked to a few people uh, from Minnesota. I've talked to a bunch of people. Who's from Minnesota? All right, all right. Uh, I talked to some people from Jersey. All right, woo! And uh, where else we got? Where? Um, what's some other states that we're from? Pennsylvania. Michigan. Dakota. New York. All right. Nice, nice. California. Arkansas. All right, all right. Awesome. So glad to have everybody here. Anybody from uh, another country? What? Brazil. Oh, nice. And we have uh, Colombia, Panama, Colombia. All right, nice. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, I'm so glad to have everybody. Brazil, awesome! Glad to have you here. Yay! All right. Um, so we'll be learning about a bunch of different styles. We're going to learn about Art Deco, about contextualism, black box modernism, and a bunch of other fun stuff and how and why they are the way they are. So the first building that we're going to talk about is going to be on your right. It's this uh, white, white-ish tower, two sections of tower with a clock, with a big clock on the top of it. It is called the Wrigley Building. It was built in 1921 and 1923. It's got two parts, and uh, this is a Spanish Revival style. Back, back in the day, well, the United States is a relatively young country, so a lot of the influence we had was from Europe. A lot of our architecture textbooks come from there, so we'll see the Spanish Revival style. That clock tower, in fact, is loosely modeled after La Giralda, which is a very, very large cathedral in Seville, Spain. Has anybody been to Spain? Anybody been to Seville? Seen the tower? It's a lovely, beautiful tower. They let you in free on Sundays, but they do not let you on free, let you in free any day of the week in the Wrigley Building. Fun fact. All right. So uh, the Wrigley yeah. Building is the same Wrigley as the chewing gum. Uh, he, the, the man that built it, built it entirely out of chewing gum profits, and uh, he he had the, he made the gum, he also, that's also where we get Wrigley Field. We got any Cubs fans? All right, yeah. Woo! All right, all right. Uh, the few of the crowd over here. So, um, it's covered in 250,000 white terracotta tiles uh, that get their different, six different shades of white to dry the eye upward. Uh, they are fireproof because uh, we have a little thing about fire in Chicago, so that is a thing. And um, they have to be cleaned once or twice a year by hand. The price you pay for being fireproof, I guess. All right. The next building that we've got is a bit more modern. Uh, we've got the Trump International Tower and Hotel. It was built in 2009 by Adrian Smith. It is an example of contextualism. Contextualism is a more modern style that uh, reflects its context. Context. So you'll see different uh, nods to and reflections of different buildings around it. That first setback or terrace is the same height as the Wrigley Building. The second setback or terrace is the same height as the Mather Tower on the other side of the river. And that third one, third setback is the same height as a building around the corner that we're going to be seeing. So that's contextualism, and then it curves, parts of it curve slightly as the river, as the river does, the glass reflects everything around it. And uh, as I said, it's built by Adrian Smith, a Chicago native. He, uh, he is also known as the tallest architect in the world. He has created uh, even the tallest skyscraper in the world, which is called the Burj Khalifa, which is basically an even bigger version of the Trump Tower that we just saw, the tallest tower in the world in Dubai and he's working on more. So now we're gonna be checking out some more buildings also on your right. Everybody's favorite twin corn cobs, the Marina City Towers. Uh, these look like two giant, uh, two giant corn cobs. I feel like you having a melote when I, when I see these. Nice corn on the cob. All these buildings make me hungry. Uh, so these were designed by Bertrand Goldberg. 
he was a student of the guy that designed the AMA building that we're passing by, the very straight, uh, very straight, uh, simple black box that we'll talk about more later. So uh, Marina City is a, uh, was created in the 60s during a time when not a lot of people lived in the city near the river. It was not uh, very well seen to be doing that. So he created these two towers to have its own supermarket, have its own market, have its own shops, have its own restaurants, its own jazz, its blues bar, um, its own laundromat, its, its own, its own the amenities. Uh, so that it was basically a city within a city. You didn't have to leave, you didn't have to get out of your pajamas to even go anywhere. Yeah, it's a calm job off of. You were in paradise. What doing was Now you may be wondering, like well, you one. may be seeing these parking lots on the bottom. It's about 18 floors of parking spaces, uh, valet only, only the most uh, elite of valets. Um, and you may be wondering, has anybody ever driven off of the edge of that, yes. or the river? And the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> um, only twice, and both of them were on purpose. The first time was for a movie called The Hunter with Steve McQueen, and the other time was for a car insurance commercial. It's a fun uh, video to watch when you're on that, you, huh? that uh, YouTube like rabbit hole. That's a fun video <laughs> to watch. All right, uh, so now we're going to jump over to the other side of the river, to one of my favorites. It's called 77 Wacker. It's a very tall glass building with white concrete and a white pediment, white Greek pediment on top. Got those Greek columns and those 30 degree angles. It's called 77 West Wacker Drive and uh, was designed by Ricardo Bofil in the 90s. And uh, this is an example of neoclassical design because you can see that it's new, it's all got modern materials, but it's got those classical elements, especially on the top of it and also on the base of it. It's got a few classic elements as well. And it, it's beautiful during the day. It's also beautiful at night. Has anybody seen that movie Tron? It kind of reminds me of that when it lights up at night. So it's a very nice looking building. Spanish architect. All right. So now we're going to jump back up to the other side of the river. On your right, we're going to see a red brick building. Not very tall, but it is quite old. It is the second oldest building that we'll see on the tour. It's got a clock tower on top to cover an unsightly water tank, which, again, with the fires. Uh, so uh, it is. It used to be a grocery storage warehouse, and now it is home to the Encyclopedia Botanica. Does anybody remember the Encyclopedia? Anybody over 30 remember the Encyclopedia? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Same color, same color. So uh, back before, back before Wikipedia Britannica. All right. So. Um, it's interesting because it's actually an asymmetrical building. There's six bays of windows on the one side and five on the other. It was not originally made that way. They had to destroy one of the bays of windows to make space for the uh, widening of this street that we're going under, which is LaSalle Street. Uh, it was, uh, I'm sure the architect was not too happy about that, but it was done in the name of progress. So now we have a very wide LaSalle Street. <laughs> Uh, also on your right, we're going to be taking a look at a little short, short, short building, a little restaurant called Chicago Cut. They are very kind and gave me this cool little Chicago pin. Uh, last time I visited, they also have really, really good food. If you're looking for somewhere to eat, especially a steak, check it out. Yeah, uh, it's on 300 yeah, South. Sure. The, uh, then we've got an example of the Ch first Chicago School of Architecture. It's this little building that's kind of white and then also, uh, also red. Chicago School of Psychology. It's got that tripartite design, the base, the cap, the shaft, and the capital. It's one of the few examples of the first Chicago School of Architecture. That was kind of the first style that we had that was our own style in Chicago, and not a copy of the European style that was done before, as we mentioned earlier. Now, the biggest behemoth of them all is the merchandise mark, also on your right. It is an example uh, okay. of Art Deco. Art Deco is typical of having these vertical racing stripes to draw your eye upward. It's got these deep inset windows, dark inset windows. It's got all the geometric shapes Alex, like floating that around. That and um, so the merchandise I mark is actually, uh, it has over four I don't know, it has about I, four I'd be scale feet, doing it. Four space. Yeah. It has 38 elevators. It covers two city blocks. It has its own train station, and it used to even have its own zip code. But that uh, now, it, now it shares. Now it shares. Okay. Um, but uh, the merchandise mart is kind of a multi-use now, and uh, in the front of it you can see these eight busts, it's got eight heads, those are of eight merchant princes that were put there by the Kennedy family who owned this building for about 50 years. 
Uh, they put all those. It's got Anne Montgomery Ward, Marshall Fields, uh, John Wanamaker, a bunch of those uh, people that made that helped make Chicago great. Businessmen that helped Chicago grow, and they are part of our history. We're gonna do that after. In 1930, it was built. It'd be like a puddle. And it had the largest surface area floor space of any building in the world until the Pentagon was built in 1940. All right, we are now in Wolf Point. This place, this area of the river is where the main branch and the north and south branch converge, and they make a bit of a Y shape, uh, and that Y shape is part of the Chicago uh, municipal device, the part of the Chicago symbol that you'll see kind of around here and there, a Y shape. Uh, this is where Chicago started. Started with three taverns on each of the three shores. Little ferries would take you back and forth, and they had inns, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of fur traders, that's how it uh, was the first business that was around. Now directly in front of you, you're going to see a giant tall building with parabolic arches. It looks kind of like a big old hot pocket. And uh, it is called uh, River Point. And uh, this is an interesting this is an interesting building. There's, uh, it's got a little bit of contextualism because it's curved uh, like the other buildings around it are kind of curved. At the, they are curved at the same radius. The bottom, that parabolic arch on the bottom is there partly because it's pretty, but mainly because it is built over train tracks and a blue line station, or excuse me, blue line tracks, excuse me. Um, and so since it's over train tracks, they can't put any weights vertically, excuse me, they can't put any support beams vertically, so they had to get creative and make it an arch. So those arches are going around train tracks. and. A lot of times when you have some sort of obstacle like that, you end up creating something even prettier or more attractive than what it would have been before. Just a simple, straight, vertical shape. I heard it falls down like once a year, so watch it on All right, we are continuing now. We are heading up the north branch of the river. I'll dock if it does. And I want you to take a look at a building a little bit ahead on your left. It's pink. Uh, and made of brick. It is called the Fulton House. It is the oldest building on the tour that we're going to see today. It is, was built in 1898. Its original purpose was to be a cold storage warehouse of giant freezer, basically. Uh, I wish I could check that out right now. It's really hot today. So, um, giant storage, giant freezer. It had its walls were, third, were three feet, th three or four feet thick, and uh, it took about three months for it to thaw when they decided to, to convert it into condos. They had to take out a bunch of horse hair and cork and all kind of stuff uh, and thaw it, break out the windows and all this kind of thing. So uh, sailor and architect Harry Weiss decided to convert it into apartments in the early 80s. So he redesigned it, uh, put these little nautical star designs on it. It's got the little porthole windows. Harry Weiss, as I said, was a sailor and a mariner, so you're going to see a lot of little nautical themes in his work. He's got several uh, buildings along the river, including the next ones that we're going to take a look at, which are the Fort River Cottages. Uh, he designed these from scratch, though, so you can see the sails, uh, the triangles that kind of represent sails from a boat. It's got porthole windows, a little spiral staircase. Uh, when he designed these in the late 80s, everybody thought he was crazy because who wanted to live in this part of the river? It was not as nice it is as it is now, but uh, jokes on them. This one of these babies just sold for over two million dollars just a few years ago. Uh, so, so yes, everybody wants to live by the river now. Uh, uh, even this branch of the river. The uh, there's some more places where people live. More apartments coming up. There's the East Bank Athletic Club on the right. They were made before people wanted to live on the river, so they had their back to the river. But you don't see a lot of people doing that and you don't see any new construction doing that now everybody loves the river and uh, so now we're gonna take a quick pause we're gonna take a few minutes pause if anybody needs a quick break bathroom break drink break um, if you have any questions I'll be up here we're gonna turn around and go back and I'll start talking again in a few minutes thank you about this bridge, this open bridge that's on your left. Everybody is always wondering, what's the deal with that? It's open, it's called the Carroll Street Bridge, and it's always open because it is, when it closes, it's too low. You can see where it would close right there. It is too low for us to go underneath it. Um, so it's always kept open, but it's a heritage site, so they don't wanna 
uh, destroy it. They want to keep it running, so they close it once a year, let a truck drive across, and then uh, so it's still working. And then they open it again and just leave it there, so that it so it doesn't get destroyed. But it is a good talking point, I suppose, and it's a it's a cool old part of our history. Train tracks used to go over it that no longer are in use, obviously. Uh, so uh, we have in Chicago, we have a lot of these movable bridges. They're called, uh, most of them are double leaf. So we call them double leaf trunnion bascule bridges, which is a really fancy French word for a seesaw. Um, they've got a bridge and a counterweight that usually fits inside of a, a little stone tower. Most of them fit inside a stone tower, so you don't see the counterweight. But uh, the counterweight is perfectly balanced to, uh, perfectly calibrated to match the exact weight of the bridge so that it's fairly efficient got a motor about the size of the motor of a, a smart car or a Volkswagen to take it up and down in a minute or two and um, we've got a we'll be pa let's see we'll be passing about 20 of those types of bridges all along the tour and there are about 40 of them in the city of Chicago so, uh, Trunnion Basco bridges double leaf usually outside of Chicago they're just called Chicago style bridges it's just a lot easier to say uh, so um, we're going to take a look and if you want I'm gonna take a very quick pause. If you want to take a picture of this beautiful canyon of buildings on your left, I'll give you a few moments to do that and then we'll continue with buildings. Alright. It's a beautiful shot right there. Now we're gonna zero our eyes to this very tall, skinny, upside down bottle looking building. Uh, called 150 North Riverside. You may be wondering how and why does it look like that? Uh, the why is because it is built between train tracks on one side and the river on the other side. So it's kind of squeezed in there and you, uh, so they had to be really narrow on the bottom. No, it is not on a diet. Uh, so it is a little bit further away from the river and uh, all right so and then uh so the building has got a little 30-foot plaza and uh that is a city ordinance it has to be you have to build any new building has to have a 30-foot plaza uh so that there's public spaces uh underneath and around it so that people can go around it now uh how do they do this how does it stay up because it's really skinny on the bottom it stays, it stays up because it's got a very deep, uh, very deep caisson. It's got 12 caissons, which are basically giant uh, cement wells uh, surrounded by steel cages and that extend about 120 feet down uh, uh, to the bedrock, uh, down into the bedrock, and that keeps it still. It's like a big giant root of a root and trunk of a tree that keep it exceptionally stable, uh, and that the height of that of that root of those caissons is actually about uh, is about a 1 16th, let's see, it's about a 16% of the height of the entire building and that's how it stays stable. It also has slosh dampers on the top which are basically giant water tanks and that's help, that helps prevent, that helps absorb any lateral motion with that water. All right, let's keep going. We're gonna take a look at another building on our left and this is under construction right now, and uh, it's going to be the Bank of America is going to be there. It's going to be 55 stories tall when it's finished. They already started putting the glass on a couple of months ago, and uh, they haven't quite reached 55 yet, but uh, it's interesting how they'll, they'll do it in different phases. So it's designed by the same company, Getch Partners, that designed the one that we just saw, 150 North Riverside. You can see those I-beams. Uh, put together in the form like a like a Y kind of in the same way that the other one that we just saw it's got that same kind of Y shaped support beams on the bottom so they kind of like that style you'll see different buildings by same architects will have similar styles sometimes all right now coming up also on your left we're going to see a giant throne and there's no game involved and it's called the Civic Opera Building it was built in 1929 the idea The idea was to have uh, the towers on the sides, uh, they were going to put office buildings, rent them out to uh, companies so they'd have revenue for the, the opera. But 
Uh, if you can see, you can see this little comedy and tragedy faces right above where it says Civic Opera build, Building. And uh, that was the, those kind of display the story. It was built in 1929 in the fall. What happened in the fall of 1929? The stock market crash. And then the Great Depression after that. And then after that, World War II. So all of these things happen in rapid succession. The original owners never got to use that opera building. And now we have uh, this Lyric, Lyric Opera is there. But the, there was no, no use. They didn't use it for a while. And the, uh, there was no construction for quite a while in Chicago. In the United States, there was not a lot of uh, construction because all of our resources were either gone or being sent elsewhere because of the war. So it was almost 30 years before we really started building anything again that hadn't already been started before the stock market crash. So when we started to rebuild, when we started to continue building again, we came up with this new style, radically different from before, called black box modernism. As you can see on your right, you can see two giant black boxes. These are called gateway centers, one and two. Uh, this style was founded by uh, German Except we have three. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And he Except we have three gateway uh, centers. said his, oh, okay. uh, his motto was less is more. He was very uh, efficient, frugal, but elegant. And they were easy to build lots of these quickly. They were easier to build because they were very simple. One of Chicago's TBS of Blue Ridge film film as well. Um, they were built by people who lived through the depression and or the war so they wanted to be very efficient they were used to working with not very much this style was everywhere for a very long time and uh but then eventually uh eventually people started saying okay less is more now people kind of saw less is a four the people kind of got tired of this same style over and over so they thought let's do some spice it up let's do some let's change it to white to box modernism uh so the gateway center number three was made up was made afterwards uh, and that was a ooh, now it has decoration they, uh, this is the international style what this style is called from the gateway so we're going to take a look at this building with the two uh, cross bars on the side those are support beams they look kind of like two x's so uh, i don't always talk about this building but when i do i call it the dos x building uh, thank you oh thank you guys so uh <laughs> support beams are on the outside uh, so that uh the people that were buying and trading and selling on the inside had an unobstructed view from one side to the other Nowadays, it doesn't have uh, these kind of things in it anymore. It has a bakery and a uh, gym to get back all those calories. To burn all those calories, sorry. So, uh, now, some more gateway centers. We've got finally gateway center number four. Wow. Also on your right, this blue curvy building. It is an example of contextualism. It was designed in the 80s. Now we're starting to go a little bit off and get a little bit more creative again uh, with our architecture styles. It's got that curve in it. That curved design, it's got the kind of bluish glass. The glass is even bubbled outward to kind of represent the ripples in the river. So that's that's the contextualism side of this building. Gateway Center number four. All of these were by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, all the big four ones that we saw. Now, has anybody seen The Dark Knight? Anybody seen the Batman movies? Right here, between these two buildings, over this bridge that we're crossing, uh, was where the Joker and his men shot a cable from one side to the other and ziplined it down into the Gotham, the Gotham National Bank right here. Uh, so that's what this building is right here. Um, it was a fun scene. You get a better view of it actually from this side. But anyway, the Gotham National Bank, it was actually just an old post office. When it was created in the 20s, it was an Art Deco style. It's got those vertical lines, deep inset windows, typical of Art Deco. It was the largest post office in the world. It, uh, the reason why we had the largest post office in the world is because we were the uh, mail order catalog capital of the world. We had Sears, Marshall Fields, Montgomery Ward, all those big stores. 
Um, and uh, so that's why we had that. This building is so large that they made it with space and space in the middle to fit a six lane highway. Observe. Goes all the way through the building. They pull for it in the middle. It also has its own, it also had its own train station as well. It was a massive building. But it fell into disuse after a while. It was not the most efficient of buildings. Uh, it was said that it uh, it took longer to send a piece of mail from one side of the building to the other than it did to send a piece of mail to California. So wow. uh, not the most efficient. <laughs> Eventually, uh, it was no longer in use. Uh, but now, uh, new people have bought it and is going. They're putting it uh, up to code. They're bringing it up to code, and they're gonna. They're starting to rent out some of the spaces to to large and small businesses. And there's plans to make it. Uh, a green building, a LEED certified building, and they're actually going to put a park, a four acre park on top of it. So that should be lovely. Helped with cooling the building off in the in the summer. I keep telling the Catholics you should put a little park on top of the boat right here. Alright, so the, the uh, our new post office is here, but it's not, a, not as historically significant, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. It's a lot more efficient though. Uh, so, uh, now we are on We've been on the south branch of the river for a couple minutes now. <coughs> if you so choose, if you have your own boat and you have provisions, and two weeks to kill, you can ride a boat and it will take you to the Mississippi and then all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So follow this all the way down, you can get to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, let's see. Oh God, can you send me the let's take a look. Yeah. On to the left, you're going to see sure. it's a little area that looks like it's some construction. They're kind of working on this park area here they're looking to extend the river walk a bit more they want to bring it out here make this area more beautiful and when the when the park area and the river area is more beautiful more people want to live here and uh and then they want it to be even more beautiful so it's a virtuous cycle when we work on things like that now uh, a little bit further ahead also on your left you're going to see a uh, kind of bubbly curvy type building designed by bertrand goldberg do you remember the other one that he built? He was the same guy the that made those building. giant corn cobs. So you can see, oh yeah, it is it's the same similar style. So uh, Bertrand Goldberg said that in nature, there are no right angles. So uh, in his architecture, you can also see that he put very few right angles. Whenever he could avoid it, he did. Uh, he wanted to look more natural, more organic. He was a student of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and uh, the guy who made all the black boxes. He uh, went a little bit off the course, uh, but I think it's really nice. Kind of looks like the Jetsons. I always reminds me of the Jetsons. Um, it is another example of a city within a city. It's called River City, by the way, and it's got its own shops and it's got its own laundromat, of course. It's got its own um, its own daycare. Even you can take your kids send your kids to school and go to work come right back don't have to go anywhere extra uh, it's also got a spot for the boats to uh, to live all year round most of the time people who have boats once the winter comes they have to take their boats out to dry dock so that they don't freeze because the ice will crush and destroy country of boats but they have little bubblers in there uh, so your boats can stay there all year round the bubbles make the water keep moving all the whole time and if the water is moving a lot it won't freeze now uh, we're going to jump back over to the other side of the river. We're going to see not much, you may be saying. We're going to see a little an uh, antenna tower, red and white, over there. Uh, we're going to use our imaginations now because there's not a lot to see. That antenna is on, located on the spot where the Chicago Fire of 1871 started in Mrs. Catherine O'Leary's barn. The barn is no longer there. Now it is the location of the yeah. Chicago uh, Firefighters Training Academy. So, um, but anyway, that's where the fire started. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, myth and legend involved, and there's, of course, the, the facts that we know. So the myth legend uh, is that Mrs. Catherine O'Leary, one night, was uh, she had her cow was in the barn, and the cow intentionally kicked over a kerosene lantern and lit the barn on fire, and that fire spread all the way around uh, and destroyed the whole entire city. That was actually a fabrication by a newspaper because uh, because the city was upset. The city was, of course, it was destroyed. About uh, almost four, four square miles of land was destroyed, of Chicago was destroyed from this bridge in front of us uh, all the way up to Fullerton. 
<coughs> Fullerton Avenue. Uh, and uh, over 17,000 buildings were destroyed. 300 people were killed. 100,000 people were left homeless without any belongings of any sort. Uh, so as you can imagine, people were sad, upset, angry, all of the bad emotions, scared. So they needed a scapegoat. So that's where the newspaper comes in and said, oh, it's Mrs. Catherine O'Leary. She was an Irish Catholic immigrant, which was, uh, it, it was seen as bad back in those days. People needed a scapegoat. So they found her cow. So I guess it was a scape cow in this, in this case. Uh, it was utterly ridiculous. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I've been milking that story for too long. Sorry, Sophie. All right. Uh, uh, all right. Um, so, uh, so that story was fabricated. They did. Uh, the poor woman died with everybody thinking that you know, of old age, thinking with everyone thinking that it was her fault. It was her cow. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the 90s that they exonerated her. They said no, it was not her fault. The 90s. Oh, sorry, the 1990s, not the 1890s. So she was long gone before they said, hey, no, it wasn't really her. So that legend kind of sticks. Um, so Chicago was in ashes. And uh, I'm going to take a really, really quick break, really quick pause. If anybody stretch your legs or whatever, I'll be back in just a minute. Why didn't you finish the story? Are you guys enjoying this? I, yes, I am. Are you enjoying the cruise? Yeah. Enjoying this. I don't want that lying around over the place. In ashes, but we rebuilt and uh, quickly. Chicago rebuilt so quick. In fact, in the next 20 years, they uh, there was we actually hosted the the World's Fair uh, in the, oh, just over 20 years after that. Um, we hosted the World's Fair. Chicago is rebuilding, and um, the one interesting thing that happened as a result of the fire. Many many things happen as a result of that. First, we got our new nickname, Second City, because we're the only city that's burnt down and got a whole new whole new opportunity, Second City. Uh, we had the World's Fair. We started building with different materials. So we thought, okay, let's maybe not use wood so much. That's because it's very flammable. So people started using uh, steel. So steel producing technologies were developing and they started uh, building upwards due to lack of space and also the fire thing. Uh, so we built our first skyscrapers in Chicago. The first one was a 10-story skyscraper called the Home Insurance Building. They sold fire insurance. And uh, it was a 10-story building. And um, later on, it was, unfortunately, later on, it was destroyed, demolished, because uh, all the other bigger, taller skyscrapers said, oh, it's too short. So they had to make space for, for taller ones. So, so yeah. Uh, so then the World's Fair, then the Daniel Burnham plan of 1909. We needed to kind of organize the city a little bit better. It was growing quickly, but they needed some sort of uh, organization. So Daniel Burnham, a architect and city urban planner, um, helped come up with the grid system that we have, which makes, it so, which makes it so easy to find your way around Chicago. It's Everything's just on a grid. And it's got those boulevards. It's got, um, he, he designed it so that all the buildings had alleys in the back so that we could put our trash and loading in the back, not in the front like new, like some other places, like some other places. Um, but yeah, so it just, it keeps it, the things cleaner in the front. So we love all the cities. All right, so we're gonna take a look at some more buildings. We got this one way a little bit further in the back with that giant statue on top. That is called the Chicago Board of Trade. And that statue on top is the Roman goddess Ceres, C-E-R-E-S of agriculture, of harvest, of grain, and is where we get the word cereal from. Also the word cerveza. Anybody know that one? Yeah. All right. All right. And uh, so that's where they used to uh, trade, buy and sell uh, grain futures. Uh, the farmers would come in and show what they had, buy, buy and sell and whatnot. Um, now, uh, coming up under this bridge, you're going to see another one that's a lot of fun, kind of a little bit of a whimsical building. It's called 235 Van Buren. Looks like uh, uh, somebody's left their file cabinet 
kind of half open the whole the whole side of it. And uh, there, those are all apartments. People live there. This was designed by Perkins and Will, and it is an example of contextualism. And you may be thinking, well, what what context? It doesn't look like anything around it, but it does from above. Those little dots and dashes are meant to represent the cars and the trucks on the six lane highway that it's right next to. They won an award for that. Perkins and Will won some awards. I think it kind of reminds me of playing uh, 80s video games, like Centipede or something like that. Uh, that's that's what I think of anyway. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Um, and then also right next to that one, we're going to see a tall, a very tall pink, pinkish building, which is called 311 Wacker. Very creative thing. Uh, it is unique in uh, in that it has a hexagonal bay, a shaft of it is octagonal, and then it's got barrels on top. So you can imagine it drives Google, it drives Google Maps a little bit crazy. Excuse me, Google Earth goes a little bit nuts when it's trying to render this. Um, it's covered in pink Texas granite that makes it bigger. All right. Now, right next to that one is the one you've all been waiting for. It yes. is the big granddaddy of them all, the Willis Tower. Standing at 1,451 feet tall, or 442 meters tall, uh, not counting the antenna. And uh, it consists of nine bundled tubes, which are towers in this case. Um, it is 110 floors tall. The architects are Bruce Graham, structural engineer Basler Khan. It is said that one day they were having a conversation about building and the Basel Khan had a bundle of nine cigarettes in his hand and he started pulling them upwards, each one at a little different height. He came up with that unique shape that you see in Willis wow. Tower, formerly known as Sears Tower. Most of us people living in Chicago kind of kind of call it Sears. It's, you know, stubborn and whatnot. But that was its name while it was the tallest building in the world, so it kind of makes sense to me. Now I'm going to take a quick break from Willis Tower just to take a look at this really cool map on the side of this black box modernism style building. Uh, this map is a to scale map of the river. And that box, that little orange Lego in the middle is uh, where you are. You are here. You can see the Y shape way up on top. That's Wolf Point, the Y shape that I was telling you guys about. And uh, that was a $800,000 mural, $800,000 tender profile. Now that we talk, now we talk about the mural. We're going to continue talking about the Sears Tower, excuse me, the Willis Tower, because there's a lot to say. It'll pop in and out of the building. Um, it's got 110 floors tall. It's got that sky deck on the 103rd floor uh, where you can see in a 360 degrees, you can see four states. You can see Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, and Hawaii. No, not, not Hawaii. Yes. Illinois, it's just wishful thinking, wishful thinking. All right, uh, right here is where you can walk out, you can look up, you can see those glass, glass boxes sticking out where you can actually walk onto the glass box and look over a thousand feet down. Has anybody actually done that? Anybody done that? Nice, nice. I, I did it once, I did it a few years ago with, with my cousins and I, so I could hold their stuff for them while they, while they went in there. So uh, I, did, I didn't go in the box. Um, but it's a really cool view. You get a lot of good pictures from there. Um, so now a lot of people see the Sears Tower and they think uh, this is a work of art, a work of beautiful architecture. It was two men, two men, Dan Goodman, American, and Frenchman, Ali Bobin, saw it as a challenge. They decided that they wanted to climb up it. So they, on separate, unrelated occasions, climbed up the Sears Tower successfully. And they both, when they made it down, were both arrested successfully. And uh, but they both got the uh, nickname Spider Man. They they earned it. They earned it. All right. So um, just to get an idea, those two antennas that we saw on top of it, uh, those are not part of the structural architectural design, so they don't count in the actual height. Um, but to get an idea of how tall those are, additional height, they're the same height as these uh, black black box buildings, Gateway Seven Twenty and Two. That much additional height on top of them, but since they're antennas, their equipment, they don't count in in the height. But if they did, it would still be the tallest building in the U.S. Just saying. So, uh, all right. Now we take a look at your left. You're going to see at eye level. You're going to see where the train tracks go by. Uh, all trains lead to Union Station. All train lines. And uh, so all these buildings are built on what's called, what's known as air rights, which is uh, basically the train tracks own the land that the, say the train companies own the land that uh, 
that the train tracks are on and they can rent it out, the railroad companies can rent out the air above, they own the air above and the, the earth below. And so they rent out a lease of about 99 years and they can make money off of that. As long as none of the supports are blocking, none of, as long as there's no columns or support beams over where the trains are passing, they're good to go. Make a little extra money that way. All right, on our left, we're gonna be taking a look at another Art Deco building. It's got those vertical racing stripes. This is called Two Riverside Plaza. Made in the 20s, like most, like all the Art Deco uh, buildings were. What else happened? A lot of stuff was going on in the Roaring Twenties. They just discovered King Tut's tomb, King Tutankhamun. So you're gonna see there's a lot of Egyptomania going on. And uh, you can see little Egyptian elements. You see the hieroglyphs on the side. You got the little obelisks. Even the shape of the building itself is somewhat somewhat reminiscent of the Sphinx. Got those lateral uh, arms and it sticks up, it's set back and sticks up in the back. So uh, all that Egyptomania going on. Now another fun one right behind it, uh, also on your left, it's got that metal truss, that giant metal support thing yeah. on there. It looks like it could be decorative, but it's actually a support. It, those are actually supports. Those are actually uh, holding up the weight of that building in a cantilever system which is basically like a giant uh, diving board. So all the weight is being held on that one side and all the supports are on the other side. Uh, the reason for that is that there's a, a train changing station right under there. That's where the train tracks change lines. So they cannot put any columns or any support beams there. Um, so that's why they designed it in that way. It is currently the headquarters of Boeing, uh, the airplane, the airplane people. And uh, it used to be the Morton Salt uh, headquarters. It was actually built for Morton Salt by Perkins and Will, my favorite creative architects. Uh, they even uh, made six little holes up on top that you can see, which would make it look like a salt shaker. So even even architects have a sense of humor sometimes. So very cute. Now, uh, on your right again, we're going to be coming up on a red brick building covered in ivy. It's a very old building. And what's special about this spot is that behind there, many years ago, in 1860, uh, they had a place called the Wigwam. And that was where uh, the Republican National Convention nominated good old Abraham Lincoln to become the 16th President of the United States. So just behind that fancy terrace and bar everybody's enjoying. And it's so where Abraham Lincoln was nominated. And we've got fun places on kind of every side of the river nowadays. Uh, the river, is, it's amazing how the river used to be this place that everybody threw their garbage and their waste and now it's just the most beautiful thing ever and we've really cleaned up the river a lot. Now we're entering Wolf Point again. Uh, we're going to be looking on on your right down. You can see where the end of the river walk. This is how far the river walk goes all the way from here to the lake. The end or the beginning, however you want to look at it. This is where it ends. Right. Their intention is to extend it all the way down to the south branch uh, and go on as far as they can. Uh, so uh, this building that we've got also on your right, it's got it's round curved. It's an example of contextualism. It was built in 1983, called the Nuveen Building. Now the context is curved like the river. The other buildings around it have also followed that context there. Curve has the same radius. More of the context, the blue glass stripes represent the blue of the sky. The green glass stripes represent the green of the river. So, oh, so it's a beautiful addition. Uh, built in 1983. Has anybody seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yes! Bueller. This is Ferris Bueller's dad's office building. Fun fact. Wow. So, uh, so you a, love, lot of, a lot of you movies love, and TV you shows love. are filmed, or were, have been filmed in Chicago. It is not uncommon to be stopped on the way to work or on the way home from work and say, no, you can't go by there. We are filming something. So the price you pay for living in such a cool city. Um, we have lots of lots of movies been filmed here. Some of the Transformers films, a lot of the Batman films, obviously Blues Brothers, which revolves around Chicago, um, The Fugitive, uh, 
Oh, the Hunter that we talked about earlier. So lots and lots of films that are Grizzwood. made here. Now, if you look on your right, real quick, you're going to see black uh, black glass rectangle that holds several $8 million projectors that project onto the merchandise mart, make, project digital images onto their usually animated images of art. And they look absolutely beautiful. They pu put those there at night, just around sunset. So it's not always at a fixed time. Just once it starts getting dark, they display these beautiful animated images and they're absolutely lovely to watch and they're free. So now uh, we're gonna take, oh, and it's called Art on the Mart. If you wanna look it up, it's called Art on the Mart. Now we're gonna look at these little gardens. We got these little sticks, poles sticking out of these gardens on the side. What is, what is that? Those are called fish hotels. Uh, those are safe havens for fish to, to uh, live and reproduce and Netflix and chill and whatever they like to do, uh, be safe from predators uh, because we're trying to get the population back to normal, back to healthy levels of fish. Back in the 70s when they checked, there was only about seven species of native fish living in the river. So that wasn't good. Nowadays, we've been taking so much good care of the river, there are over 70 species of native fish living in the river. So this is good. This is good for everyone. Makes the river healthy, makes people want to be by the river. Um, also, the river walk, as you can see here, each section of the river walk has a different theme. There's a lot of different places to eat or to sit or to have a drink, even little ice cream shops here and there. We've got pretty little fountains there. It's a great way for people to connect with the river. And uh, they used to be, when you wanted to take a nice relaxing walk by the river, uh, you used to have to, they weren't connected. You used to have to walk up the stairs, over the bridge, back down the stairs, to the side for your relaxing river walk, river stroll, not terribly relaxing if you ask me. Uh, so then they created these new little areas that go under the bridges so you can just have one long, continuous stroll, which is very nice. I like that a lot. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, another little building. It's a little short Danny DeVito looking building between the two supermodels, that one got a big 55 on the side of it. It's called 55 West Wacker Drive. And it is um, an example of brutalism, which is a little bit of an offshoot of modernism. Uh, it's got the concrete on the outside. Now, brutalism means, not trying to be aggressive, it just means, uh, it's a French, for beton brut is the French word, that means raw concrete. So it kind of looks a little bit like a fortress or a, or a castle kind of shape. This was made in the late 60s. You see a lot of uh, buildings of this particular style were made in the late 60s, early 70s, um, because that was during a time of kind of political stress, turmoil. There was the Vietnam War going on. People were kind of stressed out. There was a lot of paranoia going on in the United States. Uh, everybody was worried about communists and all these kind of things. So as a result of that, you see it in the architecture. The architecture of brutalism looks kind of like a fortress or a castle to feel safer. So we have that fine example right there. Sometimes people call it looks like a hashtag building or some, something like that. So, all right, now we're gonna be looking a little bit further ahead. And uh, once we cross onto this bridge, we're going to see a tall, skinny, green building. Called the carbide and carbon building. We're going under the loudest bridge. No. Uh, so the carbide and carbon building, tall, skinny, tall, skinny, green building a little bit further away from the river. It's got a gold tip, it's even skinnier. On the top, it's got a gold tip. And that gold is real gold. It's actually covered in a very, very thin, fine layer of 24 karat gold. It shines beautifully in the sunlight. Uh, it was built in the 20s, it's an Art Deco style. Now, what else was going on in the 20s? What else was actually not going on in the 20s? It was alcohol, exactly, prohibition of alcohol. So uh, what do people want to do, what do architects want to do when something is prohibited, anybody wants to do? Build a giant champagne bottle in the shape of a building, or a giant building in the shape of a champagne bottle is what they did. Um, so that's what that style is. Uh, it's a rumor, but it's a, definitely a rumor I'd like to share because I'm going to agree 100% with that. So carbide and carbon building. Now, uh, we're coming up on... Four, four buildings that are all up next to each other, and they are uh, 
right, the one in the middle, the tallest, skinniest one, is called the Mather Tower. It is often referred to as the Gothic Rocket because it is shaped like a rocket and its style is a bit neo-Gothic because uh, it's got newer elements in it with the Gothic, Gothic styles. Now that uh, dome, the little cupola on top, is uh, was actually breaking for quite a while. It was breaking and crumbling, so they had to replace it years ago. Um, they had to remove it and then replace it. They had a helicopter bring in a new replica and put it on top. But the replica was not made of the same material. It's not made of stone. It was made of or concrete. It was made of aluminum. So somebody made a replica of it in aluminum and and painted it to look the same, and then just placed it right up on top. Uh, so if it looks like a slightly different shade of white, that is why. Uh, but it looks really nice. That top floor, the top floor that they have there is only nine square feet, uh, nine square feet around. So uh, not a lot of big parties going on up there or anything. Uh, so right next to it is the London House. The two buildings together are part of the London House, which used to be the London Guarantee Building. They sold, mar they sold maritime insurance, but now they're the Fair Fancy Hotel. They've got a lovely hotel. They've got a beautiful terrace on top with a restaurant and bar. And uh, I highly recommend checking it out. You you go up there, you can get a drink or a bite to eat. You can sit outside if there's space because it gets busy. Um, you get an absolutely beautiful view of the river, of this branch of the river. And a really great view of that gold-tipped building that we just saw. Uh, so check out the London House uh, right on Michigan Avenue. So uh, we're crossing back under the DuSable Bridge one more time. We're going to see this tall uh, tall building, off-white building, uh, with the vertical vertical lines. It's got a little bit of a Gothic style to it. It's another neo-Gothic style. It's called the Tribune Tower. It used to be the home of the Chicago Tribune newspaper. The, they built this. The newspaper decided they want, uh, wanted a fancy office building, so they had a contest with a prize for $50,000 for whoever could design the most beautiful office building. And over uh, over 200 entries from about 23 countries uh, submitted their entries and they came up with this beautiful neo-gothic design. It's actually got a few little art deco elements in it, but overall it's definitely a beautiful building. There's, a, there's always some controversy yeah, around it, but uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, so it looks very nice. All right. Now it's being converted into yeah, get the uh, renovated, converted into condos. So they'll be selling for uh, anywhere from seven hundred thousand to seven million dollars for a home. If anybody's looking. So uh, then we've got also on your left, we're going to see a, a very tall building with a little point on top and the very recognizable NBC peacock on top, called the NBC Tower. The NBC Tower has got these vertical racing stripes got these deep dark inset windows kind of look like art deco style a little bit but it was made in the 80s so it can't be so they call it echo deco uh, because it's kind of copying but it's kind of new and it's got those flying buttresses on the side a little additional little additional flair uh, so the NBC Tower obviously is a local broadcasting station for those of you not from the US and um, and it's an also nationwide. Uh, so they kind of copied this, they modeled this style after 30 Rock in New York. Uh, and uh, they were hoping, the local stations were hoping to bring out some good new shows and have our own version of Saturday Night Live. But, uh, but I think the biggest shows that ever come out were the uh, Steve Harvey show and the uh, Jerry Springer show. But you know, take, take what you can get, right? So now we're gonna take a look at uh, the other side of the river. We're gonna do a little bit of a hide and seek with this with this little building. It's a wavy building. You can't actually see it from here because I'm talking too long about the NBC tower. Uh, you're gonna see it come around behind this black building, um, behind the black brown square and the uh, the triangle. It's called it's called Aqua Aqua Tower. It's got these little wavy lines to it. It was designed by Jeannie Gang and Associates. Jeannie Gang is a Chicago native. She likes water themes, aqua themes, aqua themes. The hotel on the first 24, and then is a, a apartment building on the rest. It's wavy because it looks nice. It is aesthetically pleasing, but it also helps with airflow. Uh, again, that's a, one of the other things you can do to help with airflow to help buildings from swaying too much. All buildings sway a little bit. It is natural. It's built into the building to let them do that a little bit. Uh, it is better to sway a few inches than to break. 
a few feet. <laughs> All right, then oh, my favorite, my absolute favorite, and it's not even finished yet, it's called Vista Tower, also on your right. Got wavy lines, also by Jeannie Gang. Anna Sophia says the tallest building in the world designed by a female-led architecture firm and the new third tallest building in Chicago. Uh, it's got these wavy lines. It's basically, it's made that way because it's got these little truncated pyramids that are placed on top of one another, alternating back and forth. And uh, it's got different colored glass. It's got different shades of glass and those different shades, those different shades of glass uh, allow different amounts of light to get in and that compensates for the different volume of each floor and that helps make a uniform temperature throughout the whole building. So there's a lot of new high-tech uh, gadgets and, and uh, things like that inside here. It is 1,191 feet tall and it's got 101 floors at the top. The, uh, the middle tower, uh, the top two floors have been sold already it's not even finished yet for 17 million dollars and then it'll be combined and uh, so very expensive high demand it's an absolutely beautiful building all right now we're going to continue we're going to be crossing lakeshore drive shortly and we're going to see uh, another kind of wavy squiggly shaped building further ahead on the other side of the on the, of the bridge. It kind of looks like, from above, it kind of looks like a fidget spinner. Huh. Unless you're an adult and looking at it from the side, it looks kind of like a flask. So, just, depe <laughs> you know, just depending on your perspective or whatever. So, uh, it's called Lake Point Tower. And uh, it was designed by students of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, that black box modernism guy. Um, they went a little bit off script also but it looks really nice. It's that uh, the little cap on top that you see is actually a restaurant, French restaurant called Cité, which means which means very expensive in French. No, it actually means city, but you get the idea. Uh, it's a beautiful restaurant. You get a beautiful view of the city. And uh, it is the only building that is on this side of Lakeshore Drive that we just crossed underneath. They, uh, there is, it is not allowed to build any not allowed to put any buildings on this side of Lakeshore Drive, but they found a little legal loophole and built it there anyway before anybody could stop them. The legal loophole has since been closed and uh, you will not see any other buildings along the shoreline. Uh, the reason for this is because of uh, businessman and philanthropist Aaron Montgomery Ward. Remember Montgomery Ward, anybody? Yeah, back in the day. Um, he, he was a businessman, he was a millionaire, he had lots of money, but he was also a philanthropist. And he wanted to keep the shoreline of Lake Michigan free, open, and clear for the public. Uh, the city wanted to keep building. This, you get money when you make buildings like this. The city gets money from that. Um, but he fought, he's fought many legal battles with the city to keep, keep this area free, open, and clear for the public, which is why we have such a beautiful shoreline. We have so many free parks, public parks, all up and down, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of free public beaches everywhere, and that is due to Aaron Montgomery Ward. He is one of my more recent heroes, even though he is long deceased. Uh, more than just a businessman, an actual philanthropist. Now we are uh, approaching we're approaching Lake Michigan. We are not going to pass the locks through to get to the other side, uh, but if we did, uh, we'd sit in there. They'd close the gates, raise the water six feet, about six feet and then we go through to the other side. Um, but it takes a while, and uh, all the fun stuff is over here. So, um, on, your, uh, on your left, you're gonna see Navy Pier with the Ferris wheel, first Ferris wheel ever was created at the World's Fair in Chicago. Uh, even in some countries, it's referred to as a Chicago wheel. Uh, but not here, we got Ferris. Um, so the Navy, yeah, Navy Pier, it used to be called the Municipal Pier. They used to do uh, pilot training exercises uh, on the long, on their long runway there. Now it's a fun place to go have a bite to eat, go have a drink. A lot of rides and attractions there. There's a theater, there's a cinema. There's all kinds of stuff to do in there. Fun stuff for kids too if you got kids. So check out Navy Pier. Has anybody been to Navy Pier yet? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun stuff to do there. So uh, feel free to check that out afterwards. 
Uh, we are going to be turning around the boat shortly. I'm going to take it one last break of a few minutes. Um, if you, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm up here. Last chance for a bathroom break. Last chance to stand up, get another drink, uh, whatever you need to do, and I'll be here. Uh, if you have any questions, and now when the boat turns around, you're going to see the most beautiful view of all. Welcome to Chicago. Wow, so all right. Here it is, beautiful Chicago, Illinois. Wow, just look at it. If you would, um, and we, I would like to ask you to remain seated until the ramp is put in place and the captain gives the okay. Uh, so we've got just a few minutes left. Yeah, now, so this area that we're in right now, which connects to the lake through locks, um, the, uh, this area used to be just just lake, and uh, the river was a lot skinnier, and it started a little bit further up, closer to Michigan Avenue. Uh, but there's been a lot of changes. Most of them were man-made uh, since then. So uh, this area used to be uh, a lot of uh, had a lot of marshland, also a little swamps of marshland, and uh, so the native there was Native American people living here, indigenous people living here. Uh, but nobody, they didn't settle here permanently. I think they saw one Chicago went in there and said bye. Uh, so um, it wasn't until the European settlers, uh, foreign settlers came here uh, and decided to, to stay in the area. The first permanent settler was named Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. He was a Frenchman. He was half Haitian also. Uh, so he's a bit of a mix. And uh, he asked the native Potawatomi people, said, what is this area called? And, uh, and they said, it's called Chicagoa. So he says, well, what, is, what does that mean? And they told him it means stinky onion. Because uh, there was a lot of stinky onion, wild onion plant growing in this area, in the marshlands, and it just had a really strong smell. So, uh, so welcome to the Big Onion. Yay, Chicago. <laughs> All right. Um, so, but now that the river is, uh, is, a lot of stuff has changed, there's no more stinky onion around. Oh, well. Uh, so, uh, so the river, as I said, used to be facing the, going in the opposite direction. It used to go into the lake. And, uh, the problem there was that uh, the city was an industrial city like many others, like most other cities around that time, don't their industrial waste, human waste, garbage, etc. And uh, and so the, the city said, oh, uh, there's a lot of people getting sick every year because that, all that stuff was going into Lake Michigan, which was our drinking water. Uh, so uh, the city got together and had a plan. Uh, I guess it didn't occur to them to stop throwing garbage in the river. Uh, they decided to, hey, let's reverse the river and send it somewhere else. So that's what they did. They brought in the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, had them come in, dig in trenches and canals uh, around and uh, change the level of the riverbed so that the river changed and uh, now it goes in the opposite direction. And we said that problem elsewhere. But fortunately, the river is a lot cleaner now uh, because we care about it now and uh, there's actually plans to keep the river clean to keep it to make it clean enough to swim in for the next 10 years We're working on it. So anyways in order to honor the uh, the Men and women who changed the course of the river the river So we made this beautiful fountain on the right, uh, which is called Centennial Fountain. This is to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of the river reversal uh, made in 1989 uh, the, uh, if you look right in the very center of it, you'll see you'll see a little hole in the middle of that of that bit, and that's where it shoots a big giant 80 foot arc of water across the other side, to the, almost to the other side of the river. It's really beautiful to watch, uh, and it goes off every hour on the hour. Uh, so if you just happen to be around this area, it's a fun thing to watch. It does not, however, go off at 4 o'clock p.m. And I had to find that out the hard way, just sitting there waiting for it to go off. Uh, but it doesn't go off at four because it's because uh, of traffic. It's just traffic. So, uh, but I recommend checking out. It's a five-minute walk from uh, from where we are now. It's right next to a couple little restaurants in the area, Lizzie McNeil's, and a few few others in that little area. That neighborhood's called Streeterville. So uh, let's take a one look at one or two more buildings. We got one on the left. It's this giant triangular shaped building. Looks like a giant Toblerone. It is called Le Suisse Hotel, by, designed by Harry Weiss. 
And uh, he was there. Remember, he was that sailor, mariner, architect guy. So you can see the kind of looks like the bow of a boat. It's got that pretty, pretty design. Oh, we can say hi to Andre, the bubble guy. Hi, Andre. How's it going? Hey, Andre. Hey. <laughs> now we would be all over them. Dad, now we would be attacking those. Like, she'd be jumping, jumping. Friendly locals, so. Um, oh, my dog loves bubbles. Like because everybody always asks, because it's cool building, a big onion dome building. It's called the Intercontinental Hotel, formerly known as the Medina Athletic Club. Medina in Arabic means marketplace. Uh, it used, it's got a lot of Moroccan themes on the inside. Even the dome, of course, kind of looks Moroccan, kind of looks that, uh, that kind of Arabic, Middle Eastern, Arab that kind of style. Um, it, right next to the dome is a platform. That platform was there for blimps. It was a blimp landing platform. They were very ambitious uh, blimps or dirigibles, as they're also known. Um, but that, that idea kind of blew up in their face a little bit. Oh, the humanity. That didn't, blimps did not end up becoming Hope you enjoyed learning about all these different buildings, different styles. We learned about Art Deco with the vertical racing stripes. What else we learned about the black box modernism and why it is the way it is, the brutalism, the contextualism, and a bunch of other different styles. Um, and all these are things that are kind of reflected in in the history. They're all kind of intertwined with the history of Chicago and the United States and the world in its own way. Um, so I hope that you have had an absolutely wonderful time. I hope you have uh, learned and had a good time. And uh, I want to thank everybody. Make sure to please stay seated until the boat is parked and the ramp is put in place. Uh, remember, we've got trash cans for any garbage. Remember to check out your uh, photos, your boarding photos. We've got excellent photographers, so you're going to take, take a look at that. Um, I'll be at the top of the stairs if you have any questions or any, any comments, whatever, afterwards. Uh, I hope you've had an absolutely wonderful time on behalf of the captain, the crew, uh, and the bartender, and myself, and Shoreline Sightseeing. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day in Chicago. Stay cool.